Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Hossein. I work as a researcher at UX Studio in Budapest, Hungary. I don't know if you heard about us, but we are basically an agency working with many companies in different industries. And I'm originally from Iran, so this accent is a Persian accent. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the urgency of designing for this new and remote reality that pandemic has brought to us. So if I would be on a stage, I would ask you to raise your hand and tell me who actually thought that suddenly our living situation would change so much the way we work, the way we socialize, and the way we attend conferences just because of a pandemic in a very short amount of time. In this past one year, you have probably also thought to yourself, about the nature of this pandemic and how it is causing radical reformations to many fields, especially to businesses, economies, and even the usage behavior. So you might know that the way we live now is quite different than before. And for just some statistics in US, the patients were visiting their doctors virtually before pandemic, that was 11% of the time. And now after the pandemic, the virtual visits have skyrocketed, skyrocketed to 46%. Besides healthcare, a lot of socialization is happening online now with governments and media telling seniors that they have, they have to stay home and they are the most vulnerable group. They have started to take this serious practice, social distancing, and instead, trying video calls to stay connected with their families during the lockdown. And you know, this is a pleasant first time experience for many of them. Some elderly people consider using other technologies besides online video call apps because they obviously would like to live a better quality of life during these times. They use apps and websites for socializing, paying bills, ordering groceries online just like us, and also for entertainment. And if you check the statistics in different countries, you would see also the subscriptions for HBO Go, Netflix, and other streaming platforms have gone really high. And part of it are actually elderly people. And that's a great news. But obviously for some of them, this is a first time experience and mastering new technology is often complicated because most products have only considered designing with younger age groups in mind. And the impact of this is especially seen today. Just one year ago, we did not expect that elderly people would adopt technology this fast. Even Don Norman, who actually coined the term user experience and now is 84 years old, says, what I see today horrifies me. The word is designed against the elderly. It's quite tragic to see the man or the person who actually we refer to him as the father of UX, the person who had UX in his job title in the world. He was the first person back in the 90s joining Apple. And now 30 years later, he's disappointed with the design direction and he is criticizing the trends and accessibility. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. But the point is that most products have been designed with the target groups in mind. And sometimes the age of the target audience is influencing the design throughout the whole process. And these radical shifts in how we live at the moment raise a very critical question for designers and people who work at the field of UX. How do we adapt so rapidly when usage behavior the age of the target audience and expectations are changing so much and so fast due to the pandemic. Before pandemic and unfortunately still now, we can see by looking at some digital products that the general belief is that senior users are too old to adopt technology, but indeed the real problem is something else. The real problem is that technology is not designed by considering their experiences in mind. And unfortunately, bad design is ruling out whole sections of the population from the benefits of technology at this point when we need them the most. And 
looking at this from an accessibility point of view, I sometimes think to myself about a quote that says, if UX doesn't consider all users, shouldn't it be known as some user experience? Unfortunately, some digital products fail to take into account the changing needs that pandemic has brought. And this is not just about designing for elderly people. This is affecting all of us. Inaccessible design is irritating users of all ages. A few days ago, I was reading a research by Nielsen Norman Group, and they actually figured out that small, small text is causing problems even among teenagers. And you can imagine that the design choices that are irritating younger users, how substantial barriers they could create for someone who has a low vision or who is suffering from some memory issues or someone who is actually getting older. And as much as I love elderly people, they will have anxiety with technology, but if it works, they will be ecstatic. The number of active, healthy, older adults is increasing all around the world and especially in US. And they are not a niche market, but businesses could perhaps take note that they are good customers. They often have more free time and more discretionary income than younger people. But despite their increasing numbers, as we can see, the world seems to be designed against them. In the last 20 years, companies were leading the way with new technologies and products, you know, with iPhones and new gadgets and new apps and devices. And they were introduced to all of us for the very first time. But suddenly now, with the pandemic, we as consumers and economies all around the world have changed much faster than businesses. We are in this very unique place where basically companies have to catch up. And this dramatic shift has certain Im implications. And that's why we as designers, UX practitioners, will need to consider the changing needs. In the human-centered design process, the idea is to build things that are advanced, but also readily adaptable. This past year, for meetings and entertainment purposes, depending on where you are, we were all escaping to different apps like WhatsApp, Zoom, and to media like Netflix and Instagram. However, some products might not have adapted themselves to be inclusive of the new user groups in this past one year. You have probably seen this project. It transports us to, let's say, uh, technological romanticism by transforming some known brands of the digital universe into a retro physical experience. And this project went viral over the internet in 2020 because of the retro look of these very famous apps. And I have been thinking, in fact, these products might not be less complicated than their equivalent products back in the 1980s. In fact, sometimes they could be even more complicated than their older versions. And the problem is that then things that used to be kept separate crash into each other, it becomes much more difficult to predict what is going to happen next. This pandemic is like a reminder that today's devices have this issue. They lack discoverability. There is no way to discover what operations are possible just by looking at the screen. You swipe left or right, up or down, with one finger, two, or even as many as five. Do you swipe or tap? And if you tap, is it a single tap or double tap? Is that text on the screen really text? Or is it a critically important button disguised as text? So often the user has to try touching everything on the screen just to find out what are actually touchable, touchable objects. An example of an app that has become part of my household and probably many of you as well is Zoom. It's a great app. I have been able to reliably stay in touch with so many people and even throw surprise birthday parties. Having said that, its UX needs to be probably retold. The interface is littered with confusing and repetitive buttons. 
for context, here is what Zoom looks like. And this is the screen you see when you are joining a call. If someone is on a video call, it will show them in the background. And I usually stumble around with multiple windows before pressing that big blue button. This is one of the areas where a simple design could definitely improve things. And the actual call screen has so many buttons, I start to lose track of things, even though I have been using this app for over two years. And the main ones the user cares about are invite, share screen, and chat. Everything else could be probably accessible in a menu bar. The chat sidebar is another panel that is overloaded with elements, making it really confusing to find things during a call. So you can imagine how mad I and my grandma get every time we have Zoom calls. The UX of a video calling platform is primarily consisting of one main task, and that's talking to other people. There are surrounding tasks in the user journey, like launching the app, starting a call, inviting others, recording a call, ending the call, and so many others. But over 90% of the time on an average call is spent simply looking at the other person or the screen and having a conversation. So in this instance, a successful video call is what would count for a good UX. Of course, Zoom and many of today's products are much more beautiful and fun than before. But as we all know, good design is not just about that. It should also be wonderful to use them. And this wonderfulness of use requires the very basic psychological principles that give rise to the feeling of the control, of understanding and pleasure. And these are not far from the basic principles of interaction design like discoverability, feedback, and of course, appropriate use of constraints. And probably now more than ever, it's time to take these principles of interaction design more seriously. This pandemic is like a reminder, and thanks to that, many of our assumptions have been proven to be wrong. Two of our assumptions were about elderly people. One I already talked about, and that was about the fact that we used to think that older people will never adopt technology in their lifetimes. But we know from telehealth and the usage behavior of elderly people during the pandemic that seniors whom we swore would never adopt telehealth or technology, they have embraced it and all of its benefits in a very short amount of time. The second wrong assumption was that, and still is, that products for older generations have to be just functional. As a result of that, unfortunately, we have designed most digital and even physical products that do not offer aesthetics. When products are developed for elderly people, they tend to be ugly or give a signal of fragility. And this is especially seen in physical products. As a result, people who need walkers or canes, they often resist. Once upon a time, a cane was stylish. Today, it is mostly seen as a medical device. And I wonder, why can't we have walkers and canes for everyday use to help us in our everyday life to carry the packages, to provide a way to sit when we are tired, and yes, to maintain our balance. We have to make products that are items of pride and stylish enough that everyone will want to use them without any discrimination of who is actually going to adopt this product. So by updating these assumptions and taking inclusive design more seriously than before, we can then start creating products that benefit people without discrimination. And we all have to know there is no reason to think that inclusive design has to come at the cost of aesthetics. Speaking of some not very good examples, here is an example of a product that does a very good job of inclusion because they have to sit with a variety of users, those who are living in places with poor internet connection and people with different abilities. 
And these are just very basics. Other video call apps have taken these also into consideration. But what I noticed by using Google Do and other video call apps, I realized that there is a feature that actually works better on Google Duo depending on your skin color. And that's the low light mode. And when I realized that, I checked to see that did they actually tested this feature with people of different colors? Did they take into consideration the skin tone? And yeah, they actually wrote a blog about this that they even took into consideration the skin tone in different environments so that so that this feature of low light mode is now working out very fine for everyone. So race, age, ability, geographic location, and some others are just some dimensions of diversity that we can consider when developing a product. And in the context of product design and inclusive design approach, it is not suggesting that a product can meet the needs of the entire population, but what it is suggesting is that we need to set our default mode to thinking beyond our assumptions about our target audience. But unfortunately, even though inclusivity and inclusive design in general has become the biggest buzzword inside corporations, bad design still exists. And my concern would be that if we have already exhausted the word before the pandemic and now that we need to talk about it and practice it more than ever, we have inclusivity burnout. In the last few years, brands promoting inclusivity through marketing campaigns have become the norm. It no longer feels revolutionary for a company to take this approach. But we, as UX practitioners and designers, can help change this. And no matter if you are a seasoned designer or just starting out to enter the field of UX, here are a few things that I would like to remind you to pay more attention to when designing digital experiences. The first one is to test. Test as many times as possible. By testing, I don't mean usability testing. For this, you don't have to be a researcher and you don't actually need any budget or resources. You can still make refinements to your app or website by using some free tools. There are web extensions out there that you can use to get a report on your site. For example, for Google Chrome, there is Lighthouse. Last time I checked, it had 30 accessibility tests. For other browsers, you can find plugins and tools and how this Tools work is like they run a test automatically and if there is a failure, they direct you to a document with suggestions for fixing the issues. So it's super easy to use these tools. And for mobile as well, there are plenty of free tools. For example, Accessibility Scanner app, which is available on both iOS and Android. Obviously, tools can't catch everything. So if you have a little bit of time, it's a smart, to watch actual people using your app or site. Another thing to pay attention to is vision. So from the age of about 50, the lens of the eye begins to harden. You know, this is a normal part of aging that makes it quite difficult to read text that's small and close. Color vision also declines and we become slightly worse at distinguishing between colors. So, Here's what we can do for vision. This goes without say that there are definitely issues with small, tiny text on websites and apps for seniors and for teenagers as well. So the general rule of thumb is to keep your text not smaller than 16. You can definitely design gorgeous interfaces at this size. For color, as we age, the roads and cones in our eyes can misalign. So Color blindness becomes a very real thing. Make sure you use plenty of contrast in your interactive elements. And there is a free tool called WebAIM that you can use to check the contrast and making sure that you are meeting the proper ratio. For accuracy, it's interesting. If we combine some barriers like dexterity issues and slight vision impairment, we quickly realize that tiny little buttons that look really cool on iOS 
are a nightmare for someone older. So we should make sure that target areas for the actions in our design are big enough to be missed just a little, but still take the user to the place they want to go. We should also design with clear affordance. For those of you who might not know, affordances are indicators of what can be done on a digital interface. For example, a button indicates that something is clickable. So if you want to support your users, then we should all make sure that these interactive elements look interactive. It sounds very obvious, I know, but unfortunately it's violated in mainstream apps. And because of a trend, we should try to actually avoid these trends like going too flat with buttons and elements. They look very good, but if users don't know what they do, then they are not very useful. So designing with affordances is going to help a lot of users, not just necessarily elderly people, but also people who have ADHD, people who are distracted, those who are multitasking and using your product, and users who are just in a rush. For clarity, as Steve Crook says, don't make me think. So this is especially true for seniors, not because they don't understand something, but rather if something isn't clear, like a result of an action, they won't tap or click into it like younger people. Exploration isn't something they care to waste their time on your app or website, so they need to know what will happen after an action is taken or they will ditch the product. During a user testing session, I was sitting with a 60 year old as she was signing up for an account. She was asked to complete a series of security questions. She read the first question out loud. What was the model of your first car? She looked at me and she started laughing saying, I have no idea what car did I have in 1968? What a stupid question. So you see what happened here. Probably it's natural for a 30 year old programmer to assume this question has some meaning for everyone, but it probably contains this implicit assumption about which life stage the user is at. And back to the rule of don't make me think comes, don't make me remember. If someone has to memorize how to perform an action, they probably won't remember it. They won't remember it. For seniors, this is even more true. So clearly labeling actions in your UI will definitely guide your users, even if they are using your product daily. And yeah, these are just some principles that you probably are using them and have heard about them, but anyone who works on a product has probably heard from stakeholders some justifications to avoid inclusive design or interaction design in general by saying like, I have heard, oh, our product is made for big businesses. Disabled people or seniors don't tend to work at those kind of places. I've also heard a lot for smaller products saying that we have a small user base and none of them are elderly people. From B2B businesses, I have heard sayings like, this is only an internal product, why should it be usable for everyone? And when you combine these perceptions, you start to wonder, where do elderly people work? If not at big businesses and not in small groups, then where? And if the answer is nowhere, then it's worth considering why it is so difficult to find job or design for people that uh, stakeholders think don't, they don't even exist. Another misconception about designing for elderly people and accessibility in general is that uh, people saying that, oh, it's gonna make the product look boring. I have also heard people saying like, oh, this product is used by mostly people from 20 to 45. And if we are going to design it for someone older, it's not gonna be as engaging, but it doesn't have to be that way. Accessibility doesn't mean removing all your graphics and colors. Great examples of beautiful websites that are fully accessible are out there. For example, apple.com or the White House. And speaking of accessibility and the misconceptions around this topic, 
I would like to leave you with the following idea from Kat Holmes, who actually worked as a principal design lead at Microsoft, Google, and at the moment he, she's working at Salesforce. In her book, Mismatch, she suggests that we can perhaps do a better job by rethinking in accessibility as a mismatch. And she uses a definition by a World Health Organization for disabled people in 2001, which is actually stating that a mismatch interaction between the features of a person's body and the feature of the product. And when you look at it this way, this definition is brilliant. We all experience mismatches in different ways. We encounter them on a daily basis. Obviously, there are people who experience higher degrees of encountering mismatches, but it's all there for all of us. Here's an example of a mismatch. This is a snapshot of a public toilet, obviously, with a sensor on the back. And there is a nice, helpful sign, which is a good indicator of poor design. It says, wave your hand over the sensor to activate. Now, when you think about it, who is actually experiencing a mismatch in interacting with this design? Maybe somebody who has low vision, maybe somebody who doesn't have a hand to wear, and maybe somebody who doesn't read English. And so when you start to think about it, you start to question, who is this really designed for? How many people are left out? And if we think about these issues as mismatches rather than labeling users for special accessibility needs, what happens is that it squarely puts the pressure on us as designers and researchers and engineers and the teams around us to stop and think and recognize that every choice that we are making with the design and the solutions was maybe increasing those mismatches between someone's ability and a feature or a product. I think as an industry, we have an obligation to decrease the mismatches. Inaccessible design has always been a problem. It's not a new thing, but the pandemic is like a reminder to show us that, look, the adoption of digital products by different generations shows that we have to redesign our products beyond our assumptions about our target audience. By embracing inclusive design, we can then understand it is not about meeting everyone's needs, but it is about embracing everyone on equal terms. That was it for me. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, please stay in touch and enjoy the rest of the conference. All right, so we're going to get started with questions in just a second. If you have any, uh, ask them in the thread on UX OK. All right, uh, here we go. Uh, Hussein, that was fantastic. Um, as I was, it, it went as I expected. That was fantastic. That's a great talk. Um, you highlighted the, uh, the same inclusive design I was talking about, uh, I think, when Tracy talked, and that was like seeing that chart just changed UX for me. That's like one of the things that brought me in. So I, I look, anytime I see it, I'm always pumped about it. Just it's such a, a, a important thing. Okay, so we've got questions. Um, let's just dive right in. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> uh, how can we use design patterns to build user confidence with elderly users who may have anxiety about using new tech? Sorry, can you re repeat the last part? I didn't... <laughs> Apologies. Um, okay, uh, how can we use design patterns to build confidence with the elderly users who may have anxiety about using new tech? That's a very good question. I have actually been thinking a lot about this. Just one thing, two things I want to, to actually make clear is that first of all, I'm not a designer, I'm a researcher. And second of all, speaking of inclusive design, we are not trying to design for everyone. It is different from universal design. So obviously, 
it happens a lot of times that we cannot actually include users that have a spe specific needs. And a good example of what an inclusive design actually is, my favorite example is a typewriter. And you know, that solution is not solving everyone's problems, but a specific people. For example, I don't know if, if you know about it, back in 18th century, typewriter was invented because for blind people, it was difficult to communicate or send letters. So if you wanted to send a letter to someone else, you had to verbally communicate it to someone who would type it, who would write it for you and send it. And this wasn't so good for confidential information or if you wanted to have a private talk. So then typewriter was invented and now we have it all over the place on keyboards, on our, uh, on our mobiles, all of it was inspired by that. And that solution is solving the problem for blind people at the first, and then for many others, but it is still leaving out some people, for example, people who don't have hands or people who have difficulties with, with using a typewriter. So it is not about solving uh, everyone's problems with one product. So when it comes to designing products for people who might have anxiety with technology, I think here the problem is not design, designing the product itself, but rather, the issues that that person is dealing with. So it, I would say it's actually quite difficult to design something specific that works out for someone who is anxious with dealing with technology and is still living it as engaging as it should be for someone who is not. Because obviously here you have to leave out a lot of uh, design elements that could make it uh, complicated for someone with anxiety. I have a grandfather who actually inspired me for this type who does have anxiety with dealing with technology. He has never used telephone. He hasn't used anything, any technology at all. And with the pandemic, he started to catch up and started using, uh, he got a smartphone and started using WhatsApp. And it took him about six months to, to catch up and understand how these uh, applications actually work. So I would say, designing for people who do have anxiety with technology or those who haven't adopted technology before is actually quite difficult and here the question and the, the problem is more on the user itself who gets a, plenty of time to get used to it rather than the product and yeah it's it's not always possible to design something for everyone thank you um <clears throat> so this is this is definitely plays more into like your re your research role. Um, how can researchers advocate for accessibility through insights? That's a great question. This is a very big challenge. Uh, working at an agency and different uh, clients, I have to say, I have to confess that it's all it's really difficult and it's not always possible to actually advocate for accessibility and uh, trying to, to get uh, designers and stakeholders all on the same page, depending on the project and how long that is. So what researchers could actually do is like starting out with their research plan in the very beginning, discussing it with the client, or if you, you are working in-house, discussing it with the stakeholders that you are going to consider older age groups in your test. Obviously, many products do not have those people in their target audience, but it's still worth considering testing with those people. Because the thing is that when you test with those people who are out of your target audience and who are probably older than the age target audience that you are targeting is what happens is that if it works, some, if something works out for them, most probably it can work out for younger people as well. Here, I don't mean trying to make your product look boring, not at all. What I mean is that trying to test it and see if it's, work, if it's working out for older people, because usually they are seeing things from as a first time user, as a first time person who is using technology, they usually give more insights than younger people. And you can definitely use those insights from testing with older people and fit it to the stakeholders and designers. Obviously, as I said, it's not a very easy thing. It doesn't work out uh, every time. 
And it's still a challenge for myself as well. And I'm trying to learn and figure out how I can do that. But I think the, the one way uh, that comes to my mind is always trying to set it clear that, yeah, we are going to include older people for the test. I, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, thinking it's a little bit of a direction change shift. Um, so Google Translate or translation has assisted lots of companies um, translating their content. That's sometimes and more often than not, not the best option. Um, have you seen any trends in regards to how to handle multiple languages from a design standpoint? I haven't. No, I haven't. OK, uh, let me ask. Um, OK. Uh, what studies or research do you have that could be shared regarding the return on investment for inclusive and accessible design? Uh, the thought is that most companies don't realize that they're leaving money on the table. Okay, so what studies do I have available? At the moment, nothing comes to my mind, but I have had some internal uh, projects and clients that I have tried out the approach that I told you about, testing with older people, even though they were not in the target audience at all. And later on, they could see that it's actually, uh, later on, like after six months of launching their product, they could see that they could actually bring in older people because the country that they were actually having that product was, with the lockdown, the usage of the that product was increasing. And for that particular research for myself that I haven't had the time to write a case study about it worked. But yet, yeah, from top of my mind, I don't have any specific uh, research that is, or any case studies that is about this particular topic of inclusive design and ROI. Gotcha. Um, okay, I think this might be the last one. Um, okay. When working with cross-disciplinary teams, like with devs and testers and project managers, um, what would you recommend uh, so that all the teams can account for all of these different factors? So color, font size, uh, clarity, memory, like all the different like aspects of it. Yeah, this is actually more a responsibility of the designer on the team. I think they have uh, a lot more to say when it comes to choosing the font size and the colors. So what, how I usually do it is trying to first convince the designers and letting them know that taking into consideration all the accessibility needs is going to make the product look good and have more users at the end. So what I would suggest is usually actually trying to, to show some examples of products that do work out very well for older people as well as younger people. There are lots of examples out there that the two websites that come to my mind are actually the White House, which is making it super clear. Like as soon as you land, you land on the website, you can see that the website is having all the accessibility elements. It, it looks great. And what I always try to do is just trying to show some examples that we can follow all these principles. It's gonna work out. And obviously, uh, usually it's not always that easy to persuade others. And that's why I'm saying usually it's the responsibility of the designer in the team as well to advocate with the UX researcher and showing different elements and showing the design in two different versions and just comparing and showing that it actually does work out with accessibility elements on it. No, no, that's that. Thank you. I know some of these are a little bit more design oriented questions. Um, this one, uh, I think, kind of fits the bill a little better. Um, what are some practices that we can engage in to become more aware of differing abilities? So just to know what's out there and kind of think about that kind of stuff. Well, it depends if you are asking uh, with regard to methodologies or what exactly do you mean? But I, I would take uh, into consideration that uh, in terms of practices, what I try to do personally, uh, of course, as I said, I work in an agency, so I get to work with different clients and sometimes it's very short amount of time. So the easiest way for me, the easiest methodology that I can try out to prove the ROI and the benefits of accessibility is like 
just simply going out with testing uh, with people that are not in the target audience of that of that product. And the cheapest and the easiest solution is actually going with usability testing if, if you are a researcher. And yeah, that, that, that would be the easiest option actually to, to just prove how accessibility can help out and yeah. Hey man, I think that's it. Thank you so much uh, for for Thank talking. You. Today. We really appreciate your time. Um, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, I'm Hossein Raspberry on LinkedIn, on Medium, on Twitter. So you can find me under the same name. I'm gonna post the slides and also links in the Slack channel. Excellent. Well, again, man, we really appreciate it. Um, Thank you so much, everyone. Thank uh, you so much. Shout them out in the thread. Um, so we are going to switch slides real quick. I'll be right back. So just hold on for one moment.